Just weeks before the release of Amazing Spider-Man issue 26, this image was leaked online. To non-Spider-Man fans, it looked like a genuinely heartbreaking moment in which a loving father helplessly watches his two children being erased from existence. This of course left them extremely confused as to why everyone else was celebrating this. These Spider-Man fans were delighted to see this guy in pain. This guy… Paul? But why? What did this Paul do to make fans so mad? This whole thing fascinates me, but I'm yet to see an explanation that gets exactly why these fans feel this way about this guy, who for most of his existence is just a background character, barely appearing in the series or doing anything at all. So that's what I'm here to do. Alright, seems simple enough, let's go! In 1987, Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson got married. They would spend the next 20 years in real world time as husband and wife, their chemistry being one of the highlights of the series, cementing them as one of the most beloved couples in comic history. In the mid-2000s, certain higher-ups at Marvel thought that Peter being married took away from the point of his character, that him being single and not having his life together was key to what made Spider-Man so relatable, and so they manufactured a storyline to separate the happy couple. It is for this reason we got the infamous storyline One More Day, in which Peter sells his marriage to Mephisto, erasing said marriage from existence and creating a soft reboot, an altered world in which Peter is alone and MJ mysteriously hates him. This was like Pearl Harbor for Spider-Man fans, and to this day we have not shut up about it. As this new era of Spider-Man began, MJ was noticeably missing, only making her first regular appearance around a year and a half later. During this era, Marvel would tease the fans. They'd have Peter say, Ooh, marriage. Never doing that shit. Imagine me getting married. Or Mary Jane would be like, yeah, maybe we would have been together in another life. Or the time they had Mary Jane catch the bouquet at Aunt May's wedding, and everyone was like, oh shit, does this mean they're bringing the marriage back? Oh my god, they're finally doing it, the marriage is coming back. And then nothing happened between them for the next, like, three years. Still, there remained hope, and the series slowly started to build towards Peter and MJ's reunion. From MJ telling Peter that she loves him at the end of Spider Island, to them spending more and more time together, and just as they're entering a proper relationship again, <laughs> Peter gets his mind swapped with Dr. Octopus, fucking dies for like a year, and then when he gets back, MJ is understandably no longer interested because of the whole mind swap, and remains separated from Peter for the next five years. This teasing over the course of a decade, dangling the marriage in front of the readers like a carrot on a stick, it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Yes, a big part of it was the relationship itself, but for longtime fans, the marriage was a symbol of the way things were, a time where Peter was able to make real progress in his life, to grow and mature, and had relationships which reflect that. After so long, fans were starting to lose hope that this kind of era would ever make a return. And then Volume 5 happened. Writer Nick Spencer arrives on the scene, and in his very first issue he gets Peter and MJ back together. In fact, not only does he heal the relationship, but he's also hinting at something greater. As the series progresses, fans begin to speculate that Spencer's gonna undo One More Day. What with him bringing Mephisto back, and having Peter relive one of his memories from One More Day, and the cover of one of the issues, I mean just look at it. What kind of event do you think they're celebrating here? It's not fucking Christmas! It's hard to explain just how excited I, and a lot of other fans were, as this story was unfolding. I was was genuinely ecstatic each time a new issue came out, and Spencer moved one step closer to undoing Peter's deal with Mephisto. However, according to writer Dan Slott, there was never a hope in hell that Marvel was actually going to let Spencer go through with this, and so Spencer ended up undoing Sin's past instead. An equally hated storyline from around the same time, in which Gwen Stacy slept with Norman Osborn and had two weird goblin babies. This did kind of read like a compromise, but at least we got confirmation that the children weren't Normans and they were actually a trick played by an AI version of Harry. Osborne the whole time. As much as it was a letdown at first, I actually think this works way better. The ending of Spencer's run says, suck it up. It happened. Even if One More Day was undone, that wouldn't take away the effect it's had over the past 10 years. Those stories would still exist, right? You can't change the past. The best thing to do is to just accept it and move forward in the right direction. Also, it would be pretty ironic having a story infamous for undoing a bunch of stuff, and then you try and make up for it by undoing a bunch more stuff. Like, it wouldn't be fair, especially to some of those brilliant stories we got post One More Day. Endangered Species. Torch Song. No one dies, especially that brilliant dream sequence at the start of it. Clone Conspiracy. No, I'm kidding. But even that story has really good moments. After Spencer left, Volume 5 continued with a variety of writers and artists, including writer Zeb Wells, who would later take over as the main writer for the series. While I personally didn't really care for this run, I did appreciate the inclusion of Mary Jane, you know, the assurance that she wasn't going anywhere, and the fact that her relationship with Peter seemed to be on the right track. At the end of Volume 5, the two of them were planning to move in together, and Spider-Man fans across the globe were breathing a collective sigh of relief. Just as Spencer had said, Peter and MJ were proving to be truly unbreakable, and with Volume 6 around the corner, fans couldn't wait to see where they were going next. 
Towards the end of April 2022, the first issue of Amazing Spider-Man Volume 6 came out, with lead writer Zeb Wells and lead artist John Romita Jr. This new volume established a time skip of around half a year, and during that time Peter had apparently done something to become estranged from his family and friends. Aunt May is disappointed in him, his old roommate Randy hates him, and his relationship with the superhero community is rocky at best. But hang on a minute. Where's MJ? Just an issue before, they were gonna move in together. You know, the thing that people have been waiting for the past 15 years? Where the hell's she gone? It's only at the end of the first issue that we finally get to see MJ. And in these brief couple of pages, we learn that she's not only living away from Peter once more, but she now has two children all of a sudden, and her new partner is just... some guy. <laughs> we get his name, Paul. He's a guy. What? Do we get to find out more about him in the next issue? Nope. Going forward, he makes a couple of brief appearances in issues 3 and 7, refusing to give even the tiniest piece of information about who he is. His only function is to remind people of his existence, saying, hey, it's me, it's Paul. Who are you? Now, because a lot of people see Peter and MJ as being perfect for each other, and they have years and years worth of stories proving this, any attempt to separate them will inevitably feel unnatural. It'll feel empty for a lot of people. Marvel is fully aware of this, and so to fill the emptiness the best they can, they build up all these plot threads in advance to make it seem like Peter and MJ separating is inevitable, that it's the only option available for them in the context of the story. After MJ shows up at the wedding, the two arrange to meet and catch up, only for them to be interrupted by the chameleon. The chameleon kidnaps and impersonates Peter, not only being a weirdo with MJ, but also making moves on Peter's roommate at the time. This leads to Peter's roommate developing real feelings for him, and so when MJ recognises this, she assumes Peter has moved on, and any potential spark between them is snuffed out. The most frustrating part about all of this is that none of these elements come out of nowhere. They all have a pretty believable setup. They've established in an earlier storyline that Chameleon's back in town, so when he does come back to steal Peter's life, it's no big surprise. Plus, stealing people's faces and impersonating them is like his whole thing. He's been doing it since the very first issue of Amazing Spider-Man, so this evil plan is nothing out of the ordinary, right? It makes sense. Also, it was around this time that Peter was having terrible luck with dating, to the point where it was almost ridiculous. He was getting led on and rejected every two seconds and it was like, when is someone going to give this guy a break? And so when MJ, the love of his life, finally does show up and rejects him, it's like the punchline to this big long joke that had been building up over the past 20 issues. It's an annoyingly well executed setup and payoff that fits in with the tone of the story. The same sort of thing happened with Superior Spider-Man years later. Not only is Otto's plan to swap bodies with Peter carefully set up over three years in advance, but the series even goes out of its way to show that MJ sticking around is a bad thing. Otto's a creep, you don't want him hanging around MJ. And so when she goes from being a series regular to more of a guest star, it's framed as a good thing. You're like, thank god MJ is saved. So yeah, by this point people have come to expect this sort of thing. Marvel wants to have their cake and eat it too. And so they tease Peter and MJ getting back together, something will happen between them that's been set up before, and while it ends up being frustrating, it's believable in the context of the story. They're not fooling anyone, we know Marvel want Peter and MJ gone, but you can at least respect the effort on the creative team's part. This, I think, is why fans were in such denial with Paul initially. Because to them, his appearance represented only one thing. That Marvel was finally being honest. No more setups, no more plot devices, no nothing. It's this completely abrupt, zero calorie moment that says, fuck it. Gigs up. You know what we're doing by now, there's no point in hiding it. They abruptly introduced this character, immediately gave him one of the most important roles in the series, while giving so little elaboration it almost became funny. The sheer lack of characterization Paul gets initially, in spite of the catastrophic effect he seems to have on Peter's life, it's like, it feels insulting yet hilarious. It's so dumb that it becomes kind of genius, and that moved people emotionally in multiple directions at once. It's not that Peter and MJ were separated, everyone knew that was going to happen at some point, but to do it like this? People just couldn't believe believe it. They're Peter and MJ's kids, not Paul's. This has to be another reality, or a nightmare, or an illusion. This is just a dark feature, just like Flashpoint, and Peter will eventually prevent it from happening, right? Peter and MJ having a kid has always been a kind of touchy subject among Spider-Man fans. First you had MJ announcing she was pregnant in the 90s, and building Peter up to be a father over the next couple of years, only for the child to be taken away from them in the end. Then of course there's the bit in One More Day when Peter talks to his future daughter, the daughter he will never have now thanks to Mephisto's deal. And so to see this version of MJ finally getting kids of her own out of nowhere, and also the father is just some random guy, it only added to the disbelief among fans, it just couldn't be true. But it was. As we soon found out, this wasn't an illusion or another reality. Paul was here to stay. And oh boy, were people thrilled about this. People hated Paul. Like, really hated him. Here we have our boy Peter, lonely and miserable, can't catch a break, and yet Paul here, he has no problems. 
He's charming, he's fairly confident, he has unlimited money. I mean, we don't even know who this guy is. He barely shows up and yet we're supposed to believe that what, MJ just ditched Peter for him because he's just the perfect guy who in her eyes somehow holds a candle to one of the greatest heroes to ever exist? Fuck you, Paul. I know there were all the jokes and the shit posts and all that, but once the joke got old and people slowly realised that Paul was actually a thing now, this initial disbelief turned into blind rage. Of course, the story doesn't want you to like him. You're supposed to have an unfavourable reaction to him. Though I feel like the intention here was more to create intrigue for people to ask, oh, what's this guy's deal? I want to know more. Rather than just pure, unparalleled hatred. Now yes, the series isn't all bad. There are some redeeming qualities outside of Paul that are genuinely pretty cool. Take the crime lord Tombstone, for example. He shows up at the start, and he's pretty cool, especially the moment where he gets bombed to shit, and then we see him walk out of the smoke having protected his cat from the explosion. It's just, it's little character stuff like that which I do really appreciate. I know that humour is subjective, but there are a lot of moments I found genuinely funny. Whether it's Tombstone calling out Peter for being a weirdo, or J. Jonah Jameson's demon bed when he gets sent to hell. I'm actually, yeah, I'm not going to give you context for this one. Or there's this one paramedic who shows up at a crime scene and just, he just doesn't give a single shit. He's completely unbothered. That stuff aside though, most of the series is pretty sad. Like Paul has actually just ruined Peter's life. In these new stories, he is exhausted and bitter and unwilling to engage with others directly. Peter didn't start off as a team player back in the day. He had to learn to open himself up and get on with others during his years as Spider-Man. So now that he's lost MJ to Paul, he seems to have retreated back into this loner mindset as a shield from emotional vulnerability. He's regressed and it hurts to watch. He struggles in fights, getting his ass beat over and over again, which is almost embarrassing given the challenges he was able to overcome in the past. He gets out of dangerous situations not due to his own strength or indomitable will, but just by getting lucky, being saved by other people at the last minute when he can't stand up for himself. The one time he does manage to hold his own, it turns out he was being manipulated by Tombstone, so he he can't even count that as a victory. He holds the respect of absolutely no one and is honestly just one step away from making a giant web slingshot and firing himself off right into the sun. To top things off, Peter now has to share a significant amount of his time with Norman Osborn, who was cured of evilness in the last volume and has now offered Peter a job at Oscorp. It's not easy seeing the guy who killed your girlfriend be your new boss, but Norman claims to have changed so it's worth keeping an eye on at least. Wait, hang on a minute, who's this at the Oscorp offices? Oh, piss off! For Peter, it all seems like one big dead end. However, things do start to turn around when the big Judgment Day crossover happens. During this event, a giant celestial puts humanity under its judgement both as a collective and individually, giving each person on Earth 24 hours to prove themselves worthy, or I don't know, it'll blow up the whole planet or something. The celestial appears to each individual as a person from their past, and in Peter's case, it appears as Gwen Stacy. When Uncle Ben died, it was very difficult for Peter, of course, but it made sense to him. It was an immediate lesson that taught him about responsibility and self-actualization, and he was then able to move forward and put that lesson to good use. When Gwen died, however, it was senseless. There was no meaning, no obvious thing that he had to change about himself, and so, like anyone would, he tried to continue the way he was before, and just try not to think about Gwen in the hopes that it would all go back to the way things were. This of course didn't work, he crumbled due to his grief, his sense of identity just kind of fell apart, and he isolated himself from everyone. Fun times. Peter would eventually realise that if Gwen's death taught him anything, it was how to move on, and that moving on isn't just forgetting about it, it's about becoming deeply familiar with the past, incorporating that pain into this new understanding of yourself, and moving forward having changed, but stronger as a result. Reliving this horrible memory and reflecting on it. It's a painful process for Peter, but it's ultimately worth it. It's allowed him to become a more competent superhero, it's allowed him to handle other tragedies better, and he's overall just more secure in his identity. This is a topic near and dear to my heart, so I hope you'll trust me when I say that Wells gets it. I think his use of Gwen here is really effective, because it does the same thing I was talking about, but in a literal sense. Wells makes Peter literally face his past instead of running from it. And unlike Randy or Black Cat or the Fantastic Four, this is someone he can't ignore, and it forces him to stop, breathe, and evaluate his situation. It's a hard pill to swallow, but MJ has moved on. These things just happen sometimes, the world fucks you over without an explanation. But he can't live his life hoping things will go back to the way they were before. Gwen standing there, in front of him, is proof that it's possible for him to move on. It's a genuinely great way to show Peter that he'll be able to get out of this a stronger person, rather than have a character just tell him. 
Under Gwen's watchful eye, he acknowledges the people he's neglected and does what he can to get on the right track. He helps out his roommate Randy, he checks in on his Aunt May, he makes sure Miles knows how proud of him he is. He also reflects on Norman. After all, if Norman can change, if he can do the best he can to improve his life despite everything that's happened, then perhaps Peter can as well. The issue then ends with what I'd consider to be a touching moment in which Peter gets to talk to the real Gwen and gets one last moment with her before she fades away. In the following issues, we start to see a slow but sure improvement from Peter, as he starts taking some initiative in his life. He gets on with his colleagues better, he asks Black Cat about their relationship and wants to take things further. He's really taking control of things and believing that things can be better. Sure, it sucks that he's in this position in the first place. I'd love him to be more like Peter from Spider-Verse right now, but you know what? He's doing his best. He's come a long way, he's back on his feet now. Let's just be grateful for what we have. Him and Black Cat are going for a weekend away together. It's a cute little date and... Wait, hang on a minute. Who's this at the hotel? Oh no. Please! Oh my god! Why? I almost forgot about you. This is something I'm sure a lot of readers will relate to. You're trying to get invested in Peter's arc. You're thinking, hey, maybe this isn't that bad. And then Paul shows up and suddenly you're pissed off again. He pulls you out of the story that you otherwise would have enjoyed. How does Paul manage to do this? I mean, yeah, his introduction at the start was abrupt and designed to antagonize people. And so whenever he shows up again, it takes you back to that feeling at the beginning. It reminds you how annoyed you were. And yes, seeing him cruise by without any problems while we've had to see Peter struggle to get to where he is, it's frustrating. His confidence feels unearned and so you're like, well, I don't really care about these other characters anymore because I've been reminded that this smug asshole exists. Still though, I don't think that's it. I don't think that fully describes why Paul is able to take you out of the story the way he does. I think the answer, then, can be found by looking back. Before Paul, before Mephisto. A much more peaceful time where I'd find myself enjoying a story more often than not. And it wasn't just that these stories were good, but it felt like both the author and the audience were on the same page in terms of what Spider-Man should be. Take Straczynski's run, for example, also drawn by Romita Jr. For the longest time, it felt like Straczynski's opinion and my own opinion were in harmony. He thought Spider-Man should be growing up and making progress with his life, and I thought the same. He thought Peter and MJ should be together and they should be closer with Aunt May, and I was right there along with him. It was all nice between him, the writer, me, the reader, these two parties having a gay old time together. But then along came one more day, and it introduced this third opinion all of a sudden. Not Straczynski, the writer, not me, the reader, but the editors, the guys at the top. And they interfered with our arrangement like the hand of God, taking all of Straczynski's hard work, taking all of my enjoyment and investment, and dismissing it. Nope. It's like this now. It was condescending, almost. This third party coming in and being like, aw, this is nice. You guys, the author and the audience, getting along all swell. <laughs> well, sorry to break it to you, but uh, we actually know what's better for you guys. We'll, uh, we'll take it from here. Hope you like Misery, by the way, because you're getting ten whole years of it. Now, the editorial team have given their reasons for doing this. There's the interview with the editor-in-chief at the time where he explained that it's to preserve the longevity of the series. That if Peter stayed with MJ, it would age him up too much. His life would be less dramatic. His stories would be less accessible to younger readers and it wouldn't allow them to keep the series going indefinitely. And yeah, that may be true from a perspective, but would that not still be better? Would it not be better to let Peter and MJ stay together in pursuit of something true and beautiful and maybe the series would have to end or at the very least become less accessible for some people? Would that not be preferable to keeping him young and miserable, squeezing out as many stories as you can out of him, dragging him through the mud just so you can sell more issues and get as many readers as humanly possible? But no, sure, go ahead, you guys know best. Of course, every comic ever released by Marvel has been influenced by an editor in some way or another. An editor changing something the writer wanted is nothing new. In fact, it happens all the time, especially with Spider-Man. But the thing is, you as a reader shouldn't be thinking about that. One More Day's biggest crime was drawing your attention away from the story and characters and directing it towards this third party. This interference that was previously just in the background, you know, silently pulling strings, and bringing it to the forefront, making it so you just can't ignore it anymore. Anymore. You can actually see Straczynski protesting the editor's decision in the story, giving Peter all the reasons not to take the deal with Mephisto, begging him not to bend to the will of this third party. And yet Peter still takes the deal in the end, because the writer can't win, and we're all aware of that now. And this wasn't like the clone saga of the 90s, which was more a case of editorial incompetence, right? The higher-ups running around like, oh shit, we've got this messy storyline that everyone's getting sick of. Let's just, uh, let's just get rid of it and we can go back to the way it was before. This wasn't like Sin's past either, where everyone, editors included, pretended that it never happened straight after. 
No, this was a case of clear and calculated interference which had a proper lasting effect on the stories that came afterwards. Going forward, I had this underlying frustration whenever I picked up a Spider-Man comic. This anger at the fact that we're on this path that the author didn't want, and I didn't want, but I now know that if we try and stray from this path at all, the hand of God's just gonna come back and keep us from straying too far. Whenever a writer joined the series in this post One More Day era, they unfortunately inherited this frustration, and they could either work around it by ignoring the issue as much as possible, as seen with the brand new day stuff, they could acknowledge it and tease that it would soon go away like Spence did to a debatable degree of success, or in the case of volume 6, take advantage of it. Fuck it, maximise the anger, turn it into a spectacle. Cause that's what Paul is, right? He's not the character, I mean he barely has a personality, he's just this symbol of interference, this target for everyone to direct this decade lasting anger towards. Quite literally all he does is interfere. He interrupts these characters just as they're about to make a connection for the sake of it, just because he can. And so I treated Paul with the same malicious, devilish quality as Mephisto. Sadly, the story told in the actual comic took a back seat. For me, the real story was the editors versus fans. These guys at the top talking down to the readers, thinking they know best. And whenever I would start to forget about this and try to experience the story for what it was, Paul would just show up and I'd be like, oh yeah, I don't actually view this as a story. This is just another condescending course correction done purely to boost sales. Thanks for reminding me, Paul, dickhead. Despite Straczynski and Wells being in similar situations, Straczynski gets a pass, I think, from a lot of people, because it was his final story before leaving. He was seen as the guy who went down fighting for our side. He was the first victim of this interference that took away from what was otherwise a really solid run. With Wells, however, this interference was there from day one, and so he's unfortunately seen as complacent with editorial. It's like he didn't even try to fight back, making fans way less sympathetic towards him. When Straczynski slips up and claims that Peter was 17 when he was bitten, you could say, well actually Straczynski Straczynski, Amazing Spider-Man issue 240 clearly states that he was in sophomore year, making him around 15 years old and this has been backed up multiple times, but whatever, it's fine, doesn't affect the story in any way. But Zeb Wells, if he dares confuse things, if he has Peter say to Norman that he was once like a father to him, it's like, what? When the fuck was he ever a father figure to him in the comics? Are, are we thinking of the Raimi films here? The real Peter would never accept Norman, for the real Peter, seeing Norman's face would send him into a blind rage, he wouldn't stand the sight of him. Do your research, Wells, God you've ruined it for me, you've ruined my entire life and you've sent my dog to hell and burnt my house down. Needless to say, when I'm talking about this anger towards authors and editors and such, I am not talking about people who express it through threats or going up to the guys in person and giving them a hard time. This is a real problem, especially in comic fandoms, and that behaviour is inexcusable. It is possible to not like someone's work, to be angry with them as a creative, and then express those feelings in your own space. I think it's such a shame that Zeb Wells gets all this shit, one, because he's just doing what his editor tells him, and two, I think he has the capacity for great Spider-Man stories, genuinely. I think he can be really funny, he writes a great voice for Peter, which makes it all the more frustrating that his talents are being wasted on whatever the hell this is. John Romita Jr. is a fucking legend, he's worked on some of my favourite Spider-Man stories ever, Scott Hanna on inks, Marcio Menes on colours, Joe Caramagna, whose lettering I've been reading since before I can remember, these are all hard working guys, and so I try to get invested in it, I really do. I wish that it was just me and the author, and while we may disagree, at least it's just us, and I'd be willing to compromise if I thought they genuinely believed in what they were putting forward. There will be characters I find really cool, jokes I find really funny, moments I find genuinely impactful, but then I turn the page and fucking Paul's there, and it's like reliving one more day all over again. It was only with issue 21, after 11 months of being frustrated and left in the dark, that we finally managed to get some answers, specifically what happened with Peter and MJ at the end of volume 5, and how Paul fits into any of it. Finally, we can find out who this guy is. We're gonna find out who this guy is, yeah? Flashback to a year earlier, Peter and MJ are about to move in together. Suddenly, a man called Benjamin Rabin shows up, aka that one Spider-Man villain who showed up in a single story in 2008, also written by Zeb Wells. That's right, the person behind it all is literally just some guy. I'm sensing a theme here. Rabin's whole deal is sacrifices. He wants to perform these deadly rituals so he can please the Mayan god of mischief, and so he marks Peter and MJ and sends them to what is essentially hell, an alternate, desolate world which Rabin has already destroyed. It's 
it's here they're rescued by the mysterious Paul, apparently the only survivor of this world who worked for Rabin in the past but didn't realise what he was truly doing until it was too late. Peter and MJ are then tragically separated, with Peter being sent back to their own universe, leaving MJ stuck with Paul in the Hell Dimension. This is good though, seriously, because we can finally spend some time with Paul, right? Find out who he is. I mean yeah, we've already got his backstory and all, but that's not what I'm talking about. See, characters are truly defined by their choices. When they're under pressure and are forced to make a difficult decision, that's when you find out who they really are. And so when Paul is faced with a dilemma, when he and MJ discover two children in the wreckage and they're talking about whether to take these children in or not, his choice is… nah, leave him. Fucking hell, Paul. Okay, so we can now update what we know about Paul. He comes from hell. He helped destroy an entire world. He hates children. Marvel, are we supposed to like this guy? Just because you draw him insanely ripped in one of the panels doesn't mean I'm gonna like him. Oh yeah, and we also find out that he's actually Raben's son. So he's Satan Jr. Now, I am being a bit too hard on the man. The whole point is that he learns through MJ. He learns to let go of this selfish behaviour. This is supposed to draw a parallel to Peter. How he messed up due to his ignorance, got someone killed, or in this case an entire world, and now spends the rest of his life trying to make up for it, trying to do the right thing and better himself. This explains why MJ falls for Paul because I guess she's just got a thing for guys who love responsibility? Therefore, when Peter manages to rescue them from hell, MJ chooses to remain with Paul so as to not disrupt the family dynamic for the sake of their kids, but also because she developed a genuine bond with Paul that she doesn't want to break. Peter is not happy about this, especially since in order to get MJ back he had to burn bridges with the superhero community because he thought MJ was going to die any minute and so he stole a bunch of their stuff and betrayed them I guess. However, he respects MJ enough to accept her decision, leading us straight into the start of volume 6 where his life completely sucks. This unfortunately means though that new readers picking up the series will get the impression that MJ sucks. This feeds into the overall consensus you see online, you know the types of comments that say, ah Mary Jane, she's a cheater, she's just this damsel in distress. Gwen though, she's the perfect person for Peter, she's the real love interest here. And you know what, I wouldn't blame you for saying that if you've just seen the movies. Like okay, fair enough. But in the comics? I mean, do you really think so? I love Gwen, don't get me wrong, but she was not good for Peter, and vice versa. While they had a great deal of love for each other, and there were moments that I was genuinely really happy for them, the divide that Peter's double life created between them was just too much. It stopped them from living healthily with their love. Peter always thought about revealing his identity to her, but decided against it because there was never the right moment. He was scared of what she was going to say, what if she hated him, especially once her father died and she blamed Spider-Man for it. And so whenever Peter looked at Gwen, he saw his own fear and insecurities reflected back at him, often causing him to have complete meltdowns. This was made worse by the press in the aftermath of Captain Stacy's death. As much as Peter would hate to admit it, he really does care about his reputation. If the world constantly tells him that he's the bad guy, he's not only going to be depressed by it, but he just might start to believe it himself. So yeah, Gwen. Poor girl, bad situation. But Mary Jane? She's built different. MJ was first properly introduced in Amazing Spider-Man issue 42, and right from her first interaction with Peter, it was clear that she wasn't your traditional love interest. MJ was more independent, she played a more active role in Peter's adventures. Whenever a villain would strike, MJ would be the one saying, hey, let's go check this out. Oh, what's that Peter? You need to disappear mysteriously whenever the bad guy attacks? Go ahead, fine by me. Who am I, Gwen Stacy? Once MJ revealed that she knew Peter's identity, things got a whole lot more serious. This was Peter's first mature relationship that wasn't fueled by fear or regret. The pair were able to challenge each other, test each other's sense of pride and guilt. Not because they were angry at one another or misunderstood the situation, in fact the complete opposite, they understood each other like no one else. This did wonders for Peter's self-image, because at the end of the day the only real reflection he had of himself was in the eyes of his wife. And that was enough. He was secure in that. The reactions from the rest of the world mattered less to him. I would strongly recommend to anyone the graphic novel Spider-Man Parallel Lives by Jerry Conway, Alex Savick and Andy Mashinsky. It's a wonderful canon story that goes over both Peter and MJ's histories, showing how similar they are and therefore why they're so perfect for each other. In my eyes, it's the perfect character piece showing who MJ really is, and a really touching commentary on life in general, and it's also dead cheap on Amazon. That all being said, let's have a look at modern MJ, shall we? After the time skip, she seems to have traded in her independence for Paul. She can't be seen anywhere without him. She barely has an active role in the story to start with, showing up once in a blue moon, shutting down Peter whenever he tries to talk to her. Overall, she feels more like Gwen. Think about it. 
Whenever Peter meets her in this series, she reflects back Peter's inadequacies, his failures as a person. She's an object of desire that Peter needs to win back, but he can't because they're not on the same page. They don't know each other and he suffers because of it. The silence between them is just uncomfortable. It feels wrong, especially since the foundation of their whole relationship is communication. They still challenge each other, sure, but it feels more bitter. They're not trying to help each other here, there's an underlying anger and confusion in every conversation. Now like I said, this isn't just done by accident. It's all done to serve Peter's arc in the beginning. By changing MJ like this, we understand just how alienated Peter feels, how disconnected he is from his usual self and environment. It's only once he builds up this confidence and goes through this personal reinvention that we, the audience, are rewarded with the truth. As things get clearer for Peter, things get clearer for us also. So surely, now that this alienation has served its purpose, and with Marvel teasing the end of this whole arc, surely MJ will go back to being her usual self, yeah? After the flashback, we jump to the present day where oh shit, Raven has returned and he means business. Upon confronting MJ, Raven reveals that her kids, the ones she'd been raising for years, were never actually real. They were Raven's own creation, and just as he'd brought them into the world, he now takes them out, erasing them from this reality. Not only was this immensely satisfying for people who hated Paul because they got to see him suffer, but this was the first actual piece of evidence that this was all going away. With the children gone, the status quo established at the start of the run was finally starting to crumble, and maybe, just maybe, we'd soon wake up from all of this. When I was reading this issue, I remember thinking, okay, Raven's demanding a sacrifice here, he wants to kill Mary Jane to achieve godhood, and Paul here, he's the son of the demon, he's looking for an opportunity to make up for his father's sins. He's got nothing to lose now except MJ, who he loves enough to put her life before his. He's been tormenting us Spider-Man fans for the past year, now's his chance to make up for it, to prove us all wrong. Paul will sacrifice himself for MJ. This is, this is genius. Go on Paul, save the day. I, I love you. Okay, Raven's moving in for the sacrifice, he's going after MJ. What's gonna happen? Is Paul gonna show up at the last minute? Is he gonna sacrifice himself? Is Peter gonna sacrifice himself? Is it gonna be Norman? No wait, no, it's, it's, it's Miss Marvel? What the hell? Miss Marvel, who'd been making semi-regular appearances throughout the series, manages to trick Raven using her shape-shifting powers, and therefore when Raven sacrifices her, he's rejected by the gods and fucking dies. Paul then shows up alive and well, lets Mary Jane know of their fake children's fate, and the end. Wait, that's it? Paul's still a thing? Okay, uh, maybe that wasn't the finale after all. Hey, we've still got the Norman thing to resolve, we've, uh, we've still got Tombstone kicking about, maybe these loose ends will come together in the next story and something will happen with Paul. As it soon turned out, we found new hope starting with issue 33, when Peter is injected with the sins of Norman Osborn, turning him into an edgy Spider-Man who swears revenge on those who've wronged him. And by God, you could not believe the hype when Peter approached Norman and said those magic words. You haven't seen Paul around, have you? No reason. Obviously, Spider-Man killing someone would be pretty bad. It's never been pleasant in the past, but at this point, I think a lot of people were just so desperate for this to go away that they gladly welcomed Paul's brutal end at the hands of Peter. Finally, this is it. Peter chasing Paul like a madman, Paul running away like a little weasel, leading us to the great big moment we'd all been waiting for. You should have never come to this world, Paul. You don't belong here. I'm not going anywhere. Did you, did you do what you gotta do? <laughs> WORKS FOR ME! Uh... Of course, he doesn't actually die, he's caught by MJ using her magic powers. Oh yeah, she has magic powers now that she got from Paul, because as we all know, you've got to have powers nowadays, otherwise you're boring as shit. Forget that one of the main reasons Spider-Man's supporting cast works is the divide between powered and non-powered people, and how the civilian stuff is often way more interesting than the supervillain fights. Forget that MJ being a normal person is important to test Peter's pride, it humbles him almost. Here he is, the strong, masculine hero able to achieve incredible feats, and yet MJ, the person with no powers, no anything like that, still manages to make more money than him. She's the one putting bread on the table. She's the one who stops him from going too far, who sorts him out and provides wisdom that Peter, for all his brain and brawn can't figure out himself. And so when Peter was freed from evilness and Paul walked away and MJ fashioned herself a superhero costume, I couldn't help but feel a little let down. See, when issue 21 first came out, I made the foolish mistake of being optimistic. I wanted Paul to go away so badly I was willing to consider that maybe Marvel was onto something here. Maybe if I quit complaining and let them do their thing, then it would all be worth it. There would be a satisfying payoff. 
When I caught on to what they were doing with MJ, having her act out of character on purpose, I thought, okay, shit, I see what you're doing here. If only I'd seen this sooner. When all the reveals then fell flat for me, when Paul kept sticking around and MJ kept being weird, I still clung to this hope. I thought, next time, next time they're gonna resolve this. This is all part of the plan. And in the end, when instead of disappearing, Paul became a permanent member of the supporting cast, and instead of MJ returning to her usual self, she actually doubled down and became something which went against what made her character so special to me in the first place, I was like, oh, I guess I was just looking way too much into this. Yes, the purpose of MJ's mischaracterization was to alienate Peter, to make us feel the same way he did. But after that purpose was served, Marvel didn't need to change things back. In fact, it was in their best interest to stay where they were. They had MJ right where they wanted her, away from Peter. Spider-Man was once again lonely and miserable, or as they like to call it, relatable. Why would they want to change that? Sure, people were pissed, but it wasn't hurting their sales. People were talking about it, this was great. And yeah, I know, we should have got over it by now. MJ isn't the only aspect of Spider-Man. But as I said before, this wasn't just to do with the relationship itself. For Peter and MJ fans, them being together represented a return to the good old days. It was a victory over this interference which took away the Spider-Man we once had. And I think this whole arc reminded them that the good old days aren't coming back. That you can't really win against this unstoppable interference, this hand of God that makes the thing in the first place. This is just it now, going forward. Paul and MJ. Peter and himself. Man, this kind of sucks. Now the reason we're in this mess in the first place is because of relatability. Apparently being married wasn't relatable enough. Peter's at his most relatable when he's depressed, when he's dating other people, when he has money problems and blah 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 blah. Now I used to think that modern Peter being miserable all the time and never having his life together, that's not relatable. That being stuck in an endless loop of progress and regression, barely maturing, getting older but not wiser, it just doesn't appeal to anyone. No one's seeing themselves in that. This is a critique you see all the time in videos complaining about modern Spider-Man. In fact, I'm sure I've said something along these lines before. But now that I think about it, having read this recent volume, I don't think I'd agree anymore. In fact, I think it's the complete opposite. I think this shit is deeply relatable. See, if Spider-Man is like a dream, a fantasy of a boy receiving powers and learning to be better, then volume 6 feels like the dream has gone on for too long. It's closer to being a nightmare. The comic wants you to live in this cold world where the love between Peter and MJ is nowhere to be found. Yes, there's comedy and there's all the quirky Spider-Man superhero stuff, but at its core, the story is rather lonely and bleak. The reader is taunted with the possibility of Peter and MJ getting back together, but after we're let down again and again, we begin to realise that, oh, this isn't just a dark spot in Peter's life that he'll eventually crawl out of, we're stuck here. It's an uncomfortable realisation, and one that evokes a feeling I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. You have nostalgia for the past, right? The good old days where life could be great, and you felt like you had purpose, and you were optimistic for the future. And then you look at where you're at now, and things are kind of the same, but not really. The people who you once saw every day are now faces you see every couple months, and they've got their own new lives with new people who you don't know and probably won't get to know. You can do your best to put things back to the way they were, but it's not really going to happen. You've grown apart, it's outside of your control. Of course, you have new people in your life, new faces, but they're not like the old ones. The connection isn't as deep there, you can't see yourself creating fond memories with them. And there are moments, moments you think of where you had everything you wanted. You had the people that really mattered to you, and you just wish that time could have stood still. That if things could have just stayed like that, then it would have been perfect. But no, these moments passed you by. Eventually you'll forget what those old times were like, and you'll just keep going, heading towards a future you have no real passion for. To be clear, I'm not saying that you have to have experienced this in your own life. Not to this degree, at least. I'm just being dramatic as fuck. But it's like how you don't need to have been chased by a serial killer to empathise with people in a horror movie. You can still relate to those feelings of directionlessness and just, like, bleakness, despite not being in that position yourself. If you're a long-time reader and you've seen Peter buckling under the status quo for the past decade, it's hard not to empathise with him. You can really feel that frustration and loneliness. It fucking it gets under your skin. It's vexing. One thing I really enjoyed about the marriage was the shifts in perspective between Peter and MJ. Peter would be out fighting a bad guy and then we'd shift to whatever MJ was doing, dealing with her problems and hearing her side of things. But now, with MJ being so distant, we're stuck with Peter. Stuck in his shitty life along with him. And it's not just that Peter suffers non-stop. Because if you go back to the older comics, he was suffering pretty much every second. Spider-Man should have this terrible luck at all times, I think. No matter what stage in his life he's at. But there was the assurance that, despite the suffering, we were still going somewhere. Peter would reach new stages in his life that he could get excited for. 
What he lacked in the luck department was compensated by the joy of just being alive. Being a human person who could grow and achieve things and fuck up things entirely but be able to learn from it. He could become older and also wiser. Peter's life was tragic but in a way that kind of gave you hope for your own future. Modern Spider-Man, on the other hand, is still tragic, it's still relatable, absolutely, but more in a way that makes you think, fuck, what's the point? I praised Peter's arc in part two, him pulling himself out of that mess in the beginning. And that works, in isolation, that might be satisfying for new readers, but for those of us who know about the past enough to predict the future, it's like, well, you're just gonna take all of that away from him later. None of this is gonna matter in the end, so what's the point? The only thing Peter has for certain is time. Unlike his movie or TV show or video game counterparts, he does not get an ending. He can't. He is trapped inside a medium that is designed to go on forever. And to see a character who once brought you comfort, who you once saw yourself in, now in that state, being killed by time just slow enough that he doesn't seem to notice? I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think people pick up this series to get that feeling. Now I'm sure to a lot of you this is sounding pretty familiar. If you watch a lot of Spider-Man videos, I'm sure you've already seen another video complaining about the same sort of thing, and its whole conclusion is that Spider-Man sucks now and it will never be the same. I'm guilty of this myself, and it's not helpful. I've also tried to provide a solution to this, saying that yes, the current stuff may not be enjoyable for a lot of people, but we still have this older stuff. We can always pretend that one more day never happened, and that Peter and MJ stayed married, and just don't think about the recent stuff. And while yeah, that kinda works, delusion is a powerful thing, it's still not a good solution if you want to be active in the Spider-Man communities and get excited for new comics coming out. So instead, I've come up with a different solution. A different way of looking at things that I think is a lot more effective than just complaining all the time. This solution was inspired by a certain comic that came out recently, one that received a lot of praise and has given Spider-Man fans some much needed hope in these trying times. This comic is, of course, Ultimate Spider-Man 2024! In February 2023, in the midst of the Paul Ocalypse, Marvel Comics announced Ultimate Invasion, a four-issue miniseries with the word Ultimate in the title, leading people to believe that the Ultimate Universe, the reality destroyed during Secret Wars many years ago, was coming back. And that wasn't the only evidence guiding this theory. The maker, featured on the front cover, had been working to restore the Ultimate Universe for years now, suggesting that this new series would expand on this plan. He was going to travel to this universe and we'd get to see the Ultimate versions of these characters again. Fast forward to June, Ultimate Invasion comes out and it says it. Got ya, we've baited you. And they instead have Maker travel to a different universe, one we've never seen before. Maker then begins to reshape this fresh new world in his image, creating his own new Ultimate Universe. Using time travel, he systematically prevents most superheroes from receiving their powers, or manipulates them into joining his side so he can be the supreme ruler of this earth with no one to challenge him. Spider-Man never gets bitten, Daredevil never becomes Daredevil but is still like blind so that still fucking sucks for him, Hulk is bald and is also like the leader of China? Honestly this is the best thing I've ever read. This miniseries was also a jumping off point for Marvel to create a whole new lineup of comic books. It spawned a number of new titles set in this fucked up universe where Maker rules supreme. And so, just like the original Ultimate Spider-Man came at a time when the main series was less than amazing, this new Ultimate Spider-Man does the same, providing a positive alternative for those sick of the current Stuff. This new series follows an adult Peter Parker who has lived his life powerless, unaware of the great things he was supposed to achieve. He has a wife, Mary Jane, and two kids. He's got a decent job, a decent life, all things considered, but there's something missing. He can't shake the feeling that he was meant to be different, and as he soon discovers in the first issue, his suspicions are absolutely true. This comic gives people what they've been asking for, but in a way that feels both familiar and completely brand new at the same time. Combine that with the competence of a creative team who are all bringing their A game, and it's just... It's good. It's it's really good. It is insanely gratifying to experience this world. A world without Paul, without this interference. A timeline where Peter was allowed to grow up and keep maturing. It's just nice to see this family together, instead of having this third party come between them for no reason. For this version of Peter and MJ, communication comes first. Unlike their mainstream counterparts, they talk about their problems, they understand each other, and if there is some information that one of them's withholding, it won't be a secret for much longer, they trust each other. And while the main universe may be depressing and its sense of directionlessness can rub off on the reader, Ultimate is like the antidote for that. The ending of issue 1 says that it doesn't matter if you've lost your passion or you feel like you have no purpose or you're just letting life pass you by. It doesn't matter if you felt like that for 20 years. At any time you can make the change. You don't have to accept things for the way they are. You can always strive for more. It might take a lot of courage. You might have to let some things go and accept that the future will be uncertain from now on. But it's all up to you. It's never too late. 
And that moment, when Tony Stark appears with the spider and lets Peter know of what he's been missing, when he tells him what he was meant to accomplish and then says that all of that was taken from you. These people stole your future, robbed you of your destiny. Do you want it back? Chills! Fuck! If that doesn't make you want to go out and improve your own life, then I don't know what will. It was hard to imagine something like this a decade ago, because back then, a reliable alternative to the main series didn't really exist. Sure, you had Spider-Girl, an alternate reality in which Peter and MJ's daughter from the 90s grew up and got powers of her own, but that was soon cancelled after one more day. Then of course you had Renew Your Vows, which I do really appreciate, but it was a tie-in to the Secret Wars event, and so it wasn't clear that it would continue outside of those five limited issues. If you were the type of reader who wanted to see the continuation of Peter's journey from before One More Day, there were no consistent stories for you. You had to hope that maybe another limited series would come along in a few years, and that was it. Over the past decade though, Marvel has gotten better at listening, and the gap between these types of stories has gotten shorter. We got the sequel to Renew Your Vows at the end of 2016, which was a whole 23 issues this time. We got Life Story in 2019, exploring what would have happened if Peter grew up in real time and had children and actually got an ending to his story. Then there was Spider-Man The Lost Hunt in 2022, which took place before One More Day. And now, with the success of Ultimate Spider-Man and Peter B. Parker in Spider-Verse, I think it's safe to say that there will always be a place for these kinds of stories in Marvel's lineup. If Ultimate Spider-Man had come out 10 years ago, you would have thought, oh, this is nice, but once it's done, that'll be it, and we'll be stuck with the main series again. But now, there's a certain confidence that even if Ultimate does end, you probably won't have to wait long until another series comes out. Another universe where Peter and MJ are together, another story set before one more day. This desire for a world without Paul will almost certainly be satisfied. Now that Ultimate's been out for a while, there's an acceptance, I think, in the Spider-Man community. One more day will never be undone. The main universe will continue to be erratic and miserable and so on, but we'll always have this other stuff. Marvel is compromising here and saying, okay, we're gonna keep doing what we want over here, but we've heard your complaints, so here you go. Are you happy now? And uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy. I'm no longer wasting my frustration on the main series. I can look in every so often and see that, oh, they're giving Paul more backstory, or they're having Peter try some of Paul's iconic chicken korma, and while once upon a time I would have treated this like a knife in my back, or spent ages theorising about how Paul is secretly Mephisto, I'm now like, eh, it's not that deep. It's actually kind of funny watching it all unfold, wondering what crazy idea they're gonna think of next. Us Spider-Man fans, we don't really need to see Paul suffer anymore. This collective rage towards this character and what he represents, it's gotten kind of old. It no longer controls us. Well, I'll speak for myself, but I do think that it's a really good time to be a Spider-Man fan now. And for the first time since the start of Spencer's run, the future looks bright. Wait, I'm not done. Okay, I was reading The Ultimates, right? The Ultimate Universe's version of The Avengers by Dennis Camp and Juan Fragueri. It's really good so far, I'd really recommend it, but it establishes something that I, I just can't stop thinking about. Tony Stark, right, the Tony of this universe, has learned what the Maker did and is on a mission to put things right, to make it so that the Earth regains its heroes. His plan involves acquiring the thing that gave someone their superpowers and sending it to them along with a great big speech about how being a superhero is awesome and you should totally do it. And that's all I thought it was originally. He gives them a package with powers and a speech and that's it, he just hopes for the best. But then, Ultimate shows us that, in the case of Hank Pym, Tony actually sent him the Maker's files as well, showing him what would have happened had the Maker not stepped in and changed everything. We also see, at another point in this story, that these files contain the history of Earth-616. Hank gets to see who he is in the main comics universe and all the things that were supposed to happen to him. Now, we only know for sure that Tony did this with Hank, but he could easily have done this with other heroes. I mean, why would he just do it with one of them, right? It's likely that he sent these files out to the rest of them, too. Does this then mean that immediately after Tony gave that inspiring speech to Peter about his destiny, you know, that really hype monologue about taking back your future and doing the right thing, did he then immediately follow it up with this image? Like, there is a non-zero chance that Ultimate Peter knows about Paul and knows about all the things that led to that. And still, he chose to be Spider-Man, despite knowing all of the horrors it could bring him. I know Spider-Man's meant to be a selfless guy, but fucking hell. That's a true sacrifice right there. Alright, I'll see you next time in like two weeks, because I'm actually going to start posting videos regularly now. What, you thought I was gone for six months just working on this one video? You thought I spent all this time on this shit? I've got more videos in the bank now than Paul has appearances in Marvel Comics. 2024 is going to be my year. I'll see you soon. At night I pray for you, my Paul. I'm praying for your demise.